Okay, wonderful. Okay, hi everyone. I am Mrs. Hoy and I serve as the Future Ready Coach at Bettendorf High School. We're so excited you all have joined us today um, for the Sharing the Love for Healthcare Virtual Forum. Um, this session is all about writing and drawing. Um, so we're going to talk about phlebotomy and then also becoming a scribe. Um, so I have a couple other um, people with me today that work um, with work-based learning um, and planning for your futures in the different local schools. Um, so Mrs. Johnson, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Mrs. Johnson. I'm the career coordinator at Pleasant Valley High School. All right, Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren Hargrave Lamock. I'm the CTE work-based learning coordinator for Davenport. <clears throat> okay. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, and then also, uh, many of you know, we have Doc Rader on the call um, and she teaches the health classes at Bettendorf um, High School. Um, I'm also going to have Wade introduce himself. And so Wade is with us today to talk about phlebotomy. Wade, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Wade Borkren. I am the manager for donor services at Mississippi Valley Regional Blood Center here in the Quad Cities. Okay, wonderful. Um, with a small group tuning in today for our live session, um, I'll just throw out a couple of reminders. If you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. So when we get to the question and answer session, we can make sure that we ask those for you. Um, but we do have a lot of questions that were sent in when students first registered for the event. So we will be going through those as well. Um, let's head back to Wade. And Wade, do you wanna kind of dive in a little bit more um, about the education and training um, that you did to prepare for your current position. Um, and then if you'd also like to kind of go into a day in the life of Wade and what that looks like <laughs> at work um, and what you kind of spend your time doing. Sure. So my position now is manager. Um, I was recently promoted to manager in November. Uh, prior to that, though, I spent the first five years, roughly five years, um, as a phlebotomist. So I started here in 2015. Uh, I did have my bachelor's degree from Western Illinois. However, I had literally no experience in the healthcare field, um, anything medical related. I think I was at a point in my, in, my, in my life and career where I wanted to do something more altruistic. Um, I wanted to focus more on ways I could help the community and Mississippi Valley had a position opening for a charge position. So here we call the charge, those are the leaders of the mobile blood drive. Um, so I applied for that, um, I got that. We don't require any kind of um, education per se for the for a position here as a phlebotomist. We do all of our training in-house it's an extensive, approximately five to six months worth of training where it's both classroom and out in the field. And you'll be paired with what we call a, a preceptor, that's a trainer. And so basically over the last five years, I've worked my way up from charge to the supervisor role and now manager. Um, here at the blood center as a mobile phlebotomist, your, your basic day is you'll come in with the rest of your team You'll gather up the supplies, we'll load up our box trucks, and then we'll head out to either the school, community center, church, local business, um, whoever's willing to host us in our local communities. Um, some of you might have seen me over the past few years because I've been to all of the high schools in the Quest Cities for the last five years. Um, I'm usually the big bald guy, so I kind of stand out. So typically once we get arrive at our destination, we will unload the truck, we'll set up all of our beds, all of our screening vital areas, um, perform the blood drive, which is anywhere from three hours to five hours. Um, and then it's time to clean everything, repack, load up and head back to the center. Well, that sounds like a fun day to me. So lots of moving and changing and um, I know this year we've started doing some like two day blood drives um, because of our students being on hybrid schedules. But otherwise, like most of your days, if you were on the mobile team, you'd be getting to go to different places, which is kind of exciting. 
Yeah, that's that's a really cool part about uh, this job. It's you're in a different location every day. You work with different people every day. You get to meet new and different people every day. Um, it's, okay. it's really quite exciting. Okay. Um, so I know that I just learned um, really recently that you didn't have a program you did before being hired as a phlebotomist, which I know you just were speaking about, um, and that you actually are trained once you are hired. Um, so what would you be looking for in a person who is not a phlebotomist yet and is applying for a job? Um, what, what kind of person would you be hoping to meet that you may hire and train as a phlebotomist? Yeah, sure. So we're just looking for people who are excited to get into the healthcare field. Um, we're looking for people who really do want to make a difference in their community. After all, we really do help save lives on a, on a daily basis. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, we're just looking for people who are committed, um, really a good personality because you are working with different people every day and meeting different members of, of your community on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And we actually almost, I, I personally prefer somebody who hasn't necessarily been trained in full lobotomy elsewhere, because you can take classes at your local community college for okay. lobotomy, which is great. Um, but we prefer to teach our own technique since we do things a little differently than for like what a phlebotomist would do at Genesis Hospital. Um, everything's just a little bit different. So which is why we invest a lot in our in our training program mm -hmm. here. And you might not know this because you aren't employed by one of the hospitals, but if just so that we can make sure we span all phlebotomy opportunities for students, do you know if a student were applying for a job at one of the hospitals, would they need to do that program at the community college first? Or do you know if they run similar to you guys where they'll, they'll hire and train them in-house? That I'm not quite sure about. Okay, that's okay. No worries. I just didn't know if you knew. Um, so you kind of mentioned um, about you were at a time in your life where you were um, ready to do something more for the community, um, mm -hmm. but was there anything else that kind of excited you and made you decide, like, I want to do phlebotomy? Was there any big aha moment for you? Um, really, it just came down to saving lives. When, it, when I read it, um, I, th I think I went through Indeed looking for jobs, and uh you know, we talk a lot about saving lives. And really, it was just, that's what it came down to. I thought that was my best, the best opportunity for me to uh, serve our community by providing blood products. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was, you know, I never really thought I would be in this position where I would be a phlebotomist or holding a needle and sticking it in somebody's arm. You know, it's a, it's a little weird at first for, <laughs> for anybody new to the field. Um, mm -hmm. But it's really exciting when you get to meet all the people and hear their stories of how you have really impacted their lives or their families' lives. Mm -hmm. So as in your current position then as a manager, mm -hmm. are you still sticking the needle in people's arms? <laughs> are no, you, I'm not. No, not. I'm not. Okay. So do you I, miss it? I, yes, I do miss that. Um, I miss being out in the community. I, I miss being um, with our team. We have a lot of great great staff here. Um, we're, we're big on teamwork. Everything we do, we do as a team. Uh, so yeah, that aspect I do. I, I do miss being out in the community. I, I still try to get out and visit the blood drives as, as much as possible. I bet. Yeah, I bet. Um, okay, so we've talked a lot about like the big picture of the, you know, what does a phlebotomist do? And then kind of like the day to day. Um, but our students are also kind of interested in like the work week. Um, and I think maybe you touched on this because you talk a little bit about like, I know sometimes if a drive is going to start at 7 a.m. or, you know, whatever your earliest is, then the phlebotomist have to be there earlier. So could you talk kind of about their hours and then also like what their um, vacation or like their paid time off, like what that benefit, sure. that part of their benefit looks like? Sure. So here in the Quad Cities for Mississippi Valley Regional Blood Center, we have three centers, fixed site centers. Um, you perform the same job as you would on mobiles, but at the centers, you would have more of a set schedule. Um, kind of like working at just a regular business with regular opening hours, they don't, they don't change, they remain the same. So in our centers, we are typically open from 6 a.m. until 7 p.m. Um, Monday through Wednesday, 
We do vary a little bit on the weekends, but we are open every weekend. The mobile side, that's where it gets a little different from the center. So we rely on host organizations to allow us to come in to their establishment to perform these blood drives. So that can mean we go to the local schools. So if the blood drive starts at 8 a.m., then we're typically in like two hours before that so we can get ready and get prepared. Um, and we do go to places like the Rock Island Arsenal where they have third shift um, businesses there. And we'll go there like once a month. And that one will start at midnight and we're usually done by 5 a.m. I know that sounds kind of daunting, but it's actually a really fun, really, really cool blood drive. But we do work almost any day, any time, um, just depending on where we're going. We will, typically we don't travel out any further than about a two hour radius from Davenport. We do go out of town a couple times a year to uh, St. Louis area. That's a really fun experience. We're down there for a weekend and we'll collect around 2,500 units of blood two days down there, which is very exciting. Um, but the hours, they do adjust quite a bit on, on mobiles. So you can start early morning, you can, or you can work like a second shift hour and get off at nine o'clock at night. So it's, it's, it's a good mixture. And, and they get to mix it while they're working. So like one time they might do the morning ones, one time they might do the midnight one. Or yes, that's correct. A, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Well, not, so no day is the same as the next when you're on, when you're on mobiles. That's so it's, nice. which that's is kind of cool because you don't get stuck in that kind of routine or that out of that rut. You, sure. it's, it's a new day, literally every day. Yeah, that's um, exciting. And then you were, you were asking about PTO. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, MVRBC has a fantastic uh, program for PTO. One of the, one of the best I've, I've been a part of. Mm -hmm. So you accrue your time off based on the hours that you work every day. So essentially for every hour you work, um, you take 0.07 hours from that and that goes towards your PTO. Mm -hmm. So if you work steady for the year, which there's plenty of opportunities um, to get your 40 hours or overtime if that's what you like, mm -hmm. um, you could end the year with almost three weeks of paid time off, which is really good. Yeah. Really good. Sounds good. That's awesome. Um, so I think I know the answer to this, but today we've been working on asking all of our presenters about the job outlook for um, the career that you're speaking to. So when our students graduate school and be it that maybe they go down the route of, you know, doing like a community college program, or perhaps they, you know, I've heard before, like it'd be great. And I think you mentioned like customer service skills and um, working with the community, but then they find their, themselves applying for a job with you. Is there going to be a job in phlebotomy for our students um, in the coming years? Absolutely, absolutely. We are growing and expanding every year. Um, there's The one thing about us is there is always a need for blood. Um, it doesn't matter if it's Christmas, Thanksgiving, the middle of summer, the middle of winter, the demand for blood is ever increasing and we are always expanding. Mm -hmm. um, so talk a little bit about, and this might not be something like specific to phlebotomy, um, but we're trying to just have students hear all the good information they can today sure. um, about, I think it's really important for students to see that everyone, um, when it comes to the workplace, has weaknesses or things that maybe they're not um, as strong with and that that's okay and you maybe just have to put in a little extra work to compensate for that so is there not that I'm like trying to call out all your weaknesses here or anything but is there anything like um, we've had some people share that like maybe they're just a little bit slower in processes so they have to put in extra work to keep things you know on a timely frame um, is there anything like that that you feel like you personally have um, as a weakness um Yeah, I would say, so the, the one thing about like working on mobiles, we talked about where it's, it's different every day, um, which is exciting and comes with its own set of pros. Um, but you can, you know, there, there is a lot of change here at, here at the blood center. 
So we follow a lot of um, FDA regulations. Mm -hmm. we are, we're guided by the FDA. So there's quite frequently changes that we need to adapt to, and that's for the safety of donors, the safety of the blood products. Sometimes, as we know, some people find change to be difficult at times. Mm -hmm. So that could be the, the one challenge here is the, the willingness to accept and embrace the change mm -hmm. on a pretty regular basis. Sure, sure, that makes sense, okay. Um, is there anything that, because I don't know all the day in, day out of your current position or of a phlebotomist, is there anything that we haven't asked specifically today that you think needs to be shared about your role? Well, I just, I would like to emphasize our, our training program here. I know I touched on it, on it earlier. Um, we do take a lot of pride in our training. We spend a lot of time and effort um, with our folks because we want to support them. We want to inspire them. Uh, we want to see them grow within their role. We do take a lot of pride in that. Um, and like I said earlier, as far as our focus on teamwork, everybody here at the Blood Center supports one another because we all want to see everyone succeed. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, and then the last thing that we've been asking all of our presenters is just to share um, either um, maybe words of wisdom or something that um, was inspiring to you that someone told you as you were journey, journeying through your education to your career that really stuck with you? Or if there wasn't really anything that someone else shared, is there words of wisdom that you would have for our students um, to kind of just help and support and encourage them? Sure. So I would just kind of emphasize finding a way to leave your, your impact, your, your footprint on your community, um, your family, your friends. I think it's really important to find something that you truly care about, um, that you're passionate about. If you have the passion and, and the love for what you do, then you truly don't go to work every day and you really do make an impact. Uh, your friends, your community, your family can all realize that. And I think that's probably one of the most important things. Yeah, definitely, I would say so. All right, well, that's wonderful. Um, I think we have Pete with us now, who's also from the Blood Center. Um, so I think we'll let him introduce himself. And then Wade, I know you are super busy. Um, so if you don't have anything else you'd like to share about phlebotomy, then um, you are free to head out. Um, I definitely wanna be mindful of your time also. Well, thank you very much. It was, uh, yeah. thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Yes, thank you so much. It was so nice to see you. Actually, I have a question, Wade, oh, if you have sure. another minute. Yeah, um, absolutely. In your training program, you talked about that it's like five to six months. Is there a pay difference in the training to when they finish? Some incentive to get done to that point? Um, no. So once once you're hired on, depending on the position you're hired on, um, you'll immediately start making that wage. Okay. Um, the reason we have such an extensive program because we want to ensure that you are comfortable in your role. And as I mentioned earlier, with our guidance from the FDA, there, there are a lot of standard operating procedures that we need to learn. So it's, it's a little time consuming, but uh, worth it in the end. Great. Any other questions for Wade? I don't see anything coming up. Uh, and to add to what Wade said about the training, um, we do start out, like if you're gonna be a whole blood phlebotomist, you would earn I think we start at 15 an hour now, actually. So then there are other skills that you can add to that as a elevated training. And there you are compensated for each of those skills that you earn, learn. So that is an opportunity to increase your pay, even as that um, collection specialist. So, but you have to become proficient at collecting whole blood first. Great. Hey, Haley, real quick, the sure. question came through, what education degree do you have to have to be a phlebotomist at the blood center or just in general? Do we need to graduate from high school first or is this something that they could do while they're in high school as a senior, for instance? Graduate of high school. We, so we don't require um, any outside training other than just graduate from high school. Yeah, in fact, for, you can for, actually, for a whole blood 
you're going to actually move up to be a supervisor. So Wade was recently promoted from supervisor to manager. And he has more education than a high school diploma, but we do have supervisors who have worked their way up from a collection tech to become a supervisor only with a high school diploma. In fact, where I worked before, I became an assistant manager just on a high school diploma. And at 32 thought, okay, I'm gonna need a degree. So that's what drove me back to school. Okay. Great, any other questions? You can either put them in the chat or unmute if you'd like. Okay, you all can keep thinking, even if Wade, if you need to head out, I'm sure Pete can help us too, if you guys think of any phlebotomy questions, but I'm gonna go, um, we've got Pete's bio back up here. And um, if you wanna introduce yourself, Pete, I think we have some new students that maybe didn't get to hear from you this morning. We do, oh, well, welcome. Uh, my name is Pete Lux, I'm the Director of Donor and Patient Services here in the Mississippi Valley Regional Blood Center. We're headquartered in the Quad Cities area. We're very fortunate, I think, in this area of the country to have such a, an organization where we are uh, stewards of the blood supply. This is not just a blood center, an organization for the employees that work here, but for the entire community. We collect blood from nearly 200,000 people a year, and I oversee all of that operation from the collection standpoint with about 300 associates and we collect whole blood. Many of you may have been on a blood drive at your high school. If you're old enough, you have to be 16. And we also do automated collections on machinery at blood drives and at uh, one of 22 donor centers, I think. You can see here, um, most people know what a donor looks like. It's just a human. So I thought I would put uh, get some pictures of the end product. The, on the left where there's like a big square of blood in the middle of the picture that is red cells that have been filtered to remove the white cells so your white cells which you may have learned in science or health class are the things that attack diseases so those can cause problems in patients because those white cells may attack the patient as they see it as foreign so they, we remove those in the middle and the upper middle those are bags of platelets suspended in plasma in the bottom left are some of the sample tubes that we collect. We do about 15 different tests on donors. In the upper right is plasma, and in the bottom right is a, units of blood that have made it all the way through to be labeled. And I think those are A negative. So we label each bag. Um, has the director, are we, that's, that's what I do here. Or is that the introduction or do you want me to? Yeah, no, yeah, that's totally. So earlier, we, uh, I talked about what my day consists of. Um, so really, I usually work about Monday through Friday, sometimes on the weekend at home, um, usually like 7 to 4.30, 5 o'clock. I start out by reviewing um, several different reports of things that happened the day before, like how many donors we had, what kind of deviations that we had, although we do a great many things right, we are human and deviations still occur. So I need to know what they are, how did they occur? But I think most importantly, how do we prevent them from happening again? If we have a, a trend of deviations, let's say somebody keeps writing the wrong date, we're gonna wanna talk to that person and find out what we can do to help. If it's kind of a one-off and they wrote the wrong date one time, I'm probably not gonna worry too much about it. So that's part of what I do. What kind of success rates are we having with um, phlebotomy in collection? Um, Wade may have touched on this. I was meeting with some new hires earlier. I apologize for my delay in getting here. So we do monitor success rates of phlebotomists and I think that's key to um, collecting, to being a successful technician. We deal with volunteers, so we don't pay people to come in and donate, but we are asking probably something more valuable of them than even their own blood. It's their time to come in and donate. So it can take anywhere from 45 minutes to two hours to donate, depending on the type of product and procedure that you're coming in to do. So we wanna make sure that we're successful. So phlebotomies are, um, it's more art than science, I think. Everything we do is very science driven. You take a temp, you have the exact way to do it. You uh, scrub the arm for 30 seconds, you wait 30 seconds, and then you have to put this needle in a donor's arm and you can't even see where it's going. So that really does take talent and skill that is not usually acquired overnight. You know, so we, that's why we have such an extensive time where 
we work with people until they're very proficient. But we require that um, you have a 96.5% success rate. So that's kind of hard to say out of 100 donors, you have to, you can fail three and a half times. So really out of 200 donors, you need to have 194 units of blood, 200 donors. So we wanna make sure that we get people to that point. And in fact, we even have an incentive program that if your success rate is 97% or higher, then you can earn some additional bonus or revenue money. So that's good, you can earn yeah. more income. Yeah. So that's some of the things I look at. Uh, I help the managers, uh, one of whom is Wade, in what they're trying to accomplish and get done. We meet, um, I meet with each of them once a week to talk about where they are in their success uh, because I want to make sure they're successful as well as their team and focus on what they're doing right, where they have challenges, and making sure that they are engaged in what they're doing. If you have a manager who loses that engagement, they're not going to be successful. So you really have to keep them motivated and um, show that you care about what they're doing and their well-being and that they're balancing their work and life. And um, so all of that kind of comes into play when you're leading such a big team. Sure. So, um, so we're already getting a couple questions for you guys. Okay. So maybe we'll jump into those. Um, so real quickly, I think both of you mentioned something about... Um, the pay range, but if you could just real quickly um, repeat it, just because I don't know that I remember it, like between where someone starts in their training, what they get paid when they finish their training, and then like, is there um, a, a way that you like bump up their pay as they go along um, before getting to like the supervisory role? So just within that phlebotomy role, what does that look like? Wait, do you want to take that? Sure. So like, um, as what Pete was touching on a little earlier, um, there, are, there are different ways, different roles you can take on within the company here to uh, earn more money. You can do um, Alex. You can be an Alex operator. So those are the machines. Some of you might have seen them at the high schools. Uh, we'll wheel those in. We use those to collect your, your red cells or plasma. Um, to be, become efficient, trained in that, that's a, that's a pay raise. You can be a driver for one of our box trucks. Um, that comes with a, a nice little race. You can be a preceptor. So those are the ones who are training the newer staff. That's also a raise. You can be a CDL driver. So you can, um, and we will help you uh, train for that where we will help prepare you to go get your written, uh, take your written test, take your driving test, become a CDL driver. That's about a $3 an hour jump in pay. And you can learn mobile Trima. That's a different machine that we take um, where we collect your, primarily your platelets from that. So there's uh, multiple avenues here, uh, multiple roles you can learn um, that come with a pretty good jump in pay. Okay, that's exciting. Um, okay, the next one is, um, how do phlebotomists, oh, just the thought of this, guys, I'm not good with blood. How do the phlebotomists, um, how are they trained to stick effectively? So is there like a simulation to practice or are we just practicing on real donors? So at the beginning, um, we have a couple different things we use to start you off on. So we have some pool noodles. I'm sure everybody knows what a pool noodle is. Oh, yeah. A little flotation device, right? Um, so we'll start with that. That's usually the first thing we'll do, just so you kind of get the feel of the needle, um, the motion, um, and just the, the way you stick. Uh, we also have, I guess you would call it a dummy arm. It's a pretty realistic arm that we use for, for training um, that has the veins in it. Um, it's got a pretty good feel as a human arm. But really when it comes down to it, there's nothing like getting that real live human in there with the real blood, the real veins, and um, sticking it in, in their arm. So, but that's usually about about a week after you, you start training here, and then we'll oh, get you on the that's way. That's really good. And typically, <laughs> what we'll do is we'll take volunteers. Like, actually, I'm I'm doing this as soon as I'm done here. Uh -huh. We have a couple new trainees, uh -huh. um, and I'm going to go volunteer my arms so they can they can get some practice. So that is we, very. We like to do that for a couple of days prior to going out yeah. into the centers or in the mobiles. 
That's and I, I often volunteer to be stuck. I've been the first stick for more people than I can count. <laughs> My thought on that, and I, Wade may have a similar thought, is that if they can stick the director of the department, they could probably stick somebody they don't know at all. Right. So it helps them get kind of past two anxieties. Because it is, I mean, that's a big needle and you're putting it in somebody's arm. So I have really good veins. I've seen Wade's, they're, they're good. They may not be as good as mine, but they're still pretty good. We have, a very, we have a very important question on that topic. Do you, being a phlebotomist, are you ever standing in line somewhere or like, I don't know, like at a pool or something and you see someone's arm and you're like, I could totally stick that vein? <laughs> oh, always. I think, I think any and all phlebotomists will, will tell you the same thing. You just, it's one of those things that just you'll notice right off the bat is just, wow, you need to come in and donate because that's a great vein. That's awesome. Wait, I was just going to ask you that if you were going to compliment them and be like, hey, so I work at the blood center and I just <laughs> have a really great vein. I noticed your vein. vein. Oh, if I, I know you. Vein, yeah, if I know I you. I, yeah, I see your vein. I'm like, you definitely need to come on in because that's, oh, that's a good vein. That's an easy stick. That'll be really nice. That's great. Um, could still, one of you, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I still do the same thing and recruit people based on their veins. <laughs> So. I'm not going to show either one of you my veins. No, I'm just kidding. Keep saving lives, please. Um, so what the next question is, oh, this is a really good one. Um, can someone just uh, kind of tell us the difference between whole blood, plasma, platelets, et cetera, um, and like why is it harder to collect one over another um, just so that we can kind of understand the different roles of the different donations? I'll let Pete take this one. He has over 20 years experience. <laughs> so there are uh, some differences between the collection of a whole blood unit, a plasma unit, a platelet. So whole blood unit is collected pretty much by putting the donor, the needle into the donor's arm and gravity essentially lets the blood flow out and fill the bag. So with that, you can be not a little better than a mediocre phlebotomist and be successful with that because you're not putting anything back in. So as long as you get that needle in there and the blood can flow out, that'll work. So, and that's okay for a beginner, although it often leads to a bruise for the donor. So we don't like that part. But the challenge comes when you want to return things to the donor. So in order to collect a unit of just plasma, we have to pull out the whole blood. We send it through a machine that centrifuges off the plasma, that plasma is kept separate, and then you have to pump things back into the donor. So if you don't have a good needle placement and you haven't performed a good venipuncture, you're not going to be able to return. And then you wind up with what's called an infiltration. And so that will make that procedure fail. Platelets are pretty much the same way. It just varies on how much, um, how much you collect and the centrifuge speed and what type of machine you use. So the challenge is how quickly can we move someone from be learning whole blood, becoming proficient at it, and move them into advanced training? And that's that opportunity where Wade mentioned where you can earn more incentive by performing more challenging procedures. So we look at things like success rate. Are you at least very successful at collecting units of whole blood? And then can you perform a venipuncture that allows for the return of the leftover product? And really, I think um, the plasma, any of the automated procedures, those are the challenging ones. Like okay. I said, does that cover all that? I think you However, um, it's very beneficial to the patient to give that people come in and just give platelets. Because for a dose of therapeutic platelets, it takes six donors from whole blood. But if we do it from a machine, one donor can give enough platelets to be therapeutic for up to three people. So wow, it's that's really amazing. You yeah. have very few platelets in a unit of whole blood. So we process quite a bit of blood to get that many platelets. So that is challenging, not only from using the machine and collecting the product, but from recruiting the donor as well. Sure. Pete, how um, do you recruit those particular donors that are going to donate platelets or plasma for you? Do you have a particular process that you use um, for instance, I'm a whole blood donor, but I happily would donate other yeah. other things if you needed it. That is a great question. And we look at, it's somewhat blood type dependent. So if you're O neg and you, we want you to come in and give what we call a double red cell donation. Wade mentioned the machine earlier, it's called an Alex. So 
our staff is uh, collection staff is trained to kind of recruit you on the spot because it doesn't take that much longer than whole blood to get that double red cell, maybe 20, 25 minutes. So most people can, a lot of people can work that into their day if they had planned on giving whole blood. So we recruit on site quite a bit. We, for platelets, it's dependent on your total blood volume, which is based on your gender, your weight, your height, and your platelet count. So we will collect an extra tube to test uh, and find out what a donor's platelet count is. And then if it's high enough, we'll re we have a recruitment team that will call and explain that procedure and how long it can take. Because most people would not pop in to give whole blood and say, oh, we can you you know, stay another couple of hours. <laughs> that doesn't usually go so well. Right. Plasma can be done very quickly too, relative to whole blood. So we recruit based on blood type for that. So whereas ONEG is the universal red cell donor, AB, and the RH factor doesn't matter, is the universal plasma donor. So that plasma can really go to anyone, whereas ONEG red cells can go to anybody. And it's based on the antigens that are lacking in an ONEG donor, and the antibodies that are lacking in the plasma donor. So good question. But we, platelets are the most, um, I think, difficult to recruit for. But I'm glad to hear your interest, Ann Roeder, and I'll be following up with you. <laughs> Sounds good, people have ready to donate again. <laughs> we'll come video again within the yeah, center. I know she great. loves being on that camera for that. <laughs> Sure, yeah. as long as you don't focus on my roles, we're fine. Oh, goodness me, you're fine. Wow, this is just all great, and it's so interesting. Um, so I think I asked Wade, but I'm going to ask again and ask both of you, and if you have more to share, is there anything that I didn't ask that I should be asking for people who are considering working in this line of healthcare? Well, are they going to, if they, I have a few things to add to this. Oh, please, healthcare. yeah, yeah. So we are um, definitely part of healthcare. We right. supply a product that people need. We're not necessarily there at the bedside providing that care directly. So the one key benefit to working in a blood center and being part of that healthcare, nobody is sick. Nobody is sick. They come in because they want to. I mean, even Mrs. Roder earlier said, I'll donate. Well, she's not sick. Um, she's a new donor. We try to we provide them with a great experience, but we don't have to worry about. Well, this is pre-COVID. Uh, any of them having you know um, transmissible diseases or anything that we don't already take precautions for, so they're not coming in you know vomiting or whatever. So that to me has always been one of the benefits, and I still have this huge impact on healthcare and patient care, but I'm not having to deal with sick people. That's great. That's a really good thought. I didn't think of that earlier. I like it. Wade, anything else we haven't touched on that you'd like to add or share with students? Um, I think I've pretty much got everything out there that I think is important. I like the, I like Pete's point there too, that everybody that comes in here is healthy. Yeah. And they, they want to be here, which mm -hmm. makes a big difference, really. I bet. Definitely. Well, wonderful. So this session um, was for phlebotomy and um, scribe, and our scribe unfortunately was not able to come, but we do have some information to share. So we're going to transition over to that for Mrs. Johnson to share on that. Um, once again, Wade, Pete, if you guys want to stick around and hear some more good info, you're more than welcome. But if not, we totally respect your time um, and that you might have somewhere else to go volunteer your arm at. So please feel free. <laughs> Hey guys, real quick, I totally forgot to ask. I know at least Haley and I have had our vaccine for COVID, right? Our first one, and then I'm getting my second one March 5th, I think, or something like that. Do I need to wait in between to donate? No, because of the technology that's used, that messenger RNA, there's no um, impact to the blood that um, would be, that would cause a patient harm. Your immune that's system good. is going to okay. flare up, and even that, yeah. inflammation from your immune system wouldn't really cause any problems. In fact, 
COVID in and of itself is not transmissible by blood. There's no, there's yeah. been no evidence of that. So we've had donors come in and donate and they call the next day and say, oh yeah, I tested positive for COVID. So we haven't had any, there's been no record of transmission by a blood transfusion of COVID. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great question. All right. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye. All right, Mrs. Johnson. So we had Joe Mueller who was supposed to be coming. He's a PD grad. Um, he's a current second year med student. And part of his journey to become a med student was a year of becoming a scribe. So we did a Hawkeye hometown visit. He goes to the University of Iowa currently. Um, he is going to uh, record a session for us. So we'll have that up as well. That's devoted just to that but he has a quick blurb about the scribe and, and where he did that at. So I'm gonna quick show that. And then just a little bit about a scribe. They're the people that are taking the notes and the information from the doctors. Let me expand this. Oh, but I didn't share it with, hang on, I have to share it with the sound, it helps. There we go. Uh, so we'll talk about it a little bit more after uh, you watch this part. I worked at UniPoint Pain Management up on, that's Utica Ridge Road uh, for one year. And that was a really good experience. Um, looking back on that, now that we're going into clinic and uh, a lot of my classmates are kind of struggling with how to use EPIC, which is the electronic medical record system a job like that can go a long way because I was writing 25 patient notes a day and that's kind of where you document everything you learn during a patient visit. Um, and now that I have that experience, it's like, that's something I just don't have to worry about as much going into clinicals. Uh, then I worked in a research lab at University of Iowa for two years. Uh, okay, so again, what he did on a daily basis was enter patient information and he mentioned about 25 a day. He was part-time. So, uh, you know, if you're doing that full-time, it would be probably double that amount on there. Um, and Scribe doesn't need any kind of training. You do have to apply through the national. There's not a local or go through your uh, hospitals. Those are the uh, companies that are going to hire would be the hospitals. That's great. Thank you for sharing, Mrs. Johnson. So for all of the students, uh, I know Sarah's here, but for all of our students that are going to watch the recording of this, um, we will um, also be sharing a recording where we get the chance to speak with Joe and hear a little bit more about his day-to-day -day and his big picture um, thoughts and any words of wisdom that he has to share with you. Um, so with that being said, um, all of our panelists have had the chance to speak right now. And so any questions that you have, please feel free to share um, with myself at Bettendorf, um, Mrs. Johnson at Pleasant Valley, Mr. Schneider at North Scott, and at Davenport Schools, go ahead and reach out to your counselors with any follow-up questions that you may have so that we can connect you with the professional who can help you get that answer. Um, we're so thankful for all of your time that you're taking to be with us. We are thankful for our panelists that were here today um, and took time out of their busy schedules um, to share all this great information. Um, we'll be seeing some of you upcoming here in our next section um, this afternoon and tomorrow. Um, but thank you all and have a great rest of your day.